the Arch Gaming Network is proud to bring you this board game review. Now here's your host, Sean Smith. Hello and thank you for stopping by. Today we're taking a look at Noria, which was designed by Sophia Wagner and published by Stronghold Games. Now there's a lot to get into with Noria from the setup to the tutorial, so we're going to keep this intro fairly short. That's not necessary. Anyway, Noria uses a unique wheel building system. This wheel that you will be building will contain actions on it, actions that uh, you'll be spinning uh, on this wheel, so you'll have different actions to take each round. So, a uh, very interesting mechanic, but let's go ahead and hop right in. If you want to fast forward to the setup or the tutorial or my final thoughts, uh, just uh, go ahead and fast forward to the times that are listed here. Oh, come on. Okay, so to set up Noria, we have uh, quite a bit going on here. Uh, the first thing you have these round markers here, and they say uh, times 10 on one side and just a round marker on the other. Now you're going to put cover up these circles and these wheels called knowledge uh, based on the number of players. Now, I should note, I have lost one of my round markers. We're setting up for a two player game. So normally you would also put a round marker here on the two player space. But like I said, I am missing one. All right, then you have the market over here. Uh, we have these action discs in a two uh, player game. You're going to take four of the uh, regular basic market goods. Uh, the black is obsidian, green is mylesium, and the pink is uh, energy. That is probably the last time you're going to hear me refer to them as that. They're going to be black, green, and pink. Then you have uh, City, Journey, Tool, and Bonus. And they're going to go on for your first game. One, two, three, and four. You have a stack of uh, island tiles. Two-player game. You're going to take out five, and shuffle them, and place them there. Each player is going to take their... Five, they'll have five of their um, representatives. Uh, four of them will go into the cave. One will go on to the um, island over here. They are considered an ambassador. Once you've determined who the start player is, they're going to get this token here. And then they will select one of these four tracks up here to start on. They can start on any of them that they want. And then players in clockwise fashion will take one of their workers and place them on the track as well. These gray cubes here represent politicians, and there will be four of them on these four different tracks, and then there are two tracks down here. Again, each of them will get four. Placed around the board are going to be the basic goods. You have your pink, your black, and your green goods. And then you have airships. You have the black, the green, and over here I have the pink. You're gonna have the knowledge tokens. Uh, then you have some uh, Manufacturer, these are warehouses actually. Each player is also going to get one of these. These are the cheat sheets and they're also kind of the uh, locking mechanism for your wheel. They're also going to get a sidebar here. There, it's double-sided, doesn't matter which side that you use. You're also going to get 
one of these wheels. Each player is also going to get three uh, wheels, a uh, large, a medium, and a small wheel. On the sideboards, uh, you're going to have these factories. Each player has seven factories. They, are, they have uh, little slots here that designate where they go. Each player is going to get an airship of each color. So one pink, one green, one black. Everyone gets one knowledge. And then the players get to, starting with the first player, get to take any of the basic goods of their choice to start the game. And then you'll also need to construct your wheel. Okay, when you construct the wheel, uh, there are notches in this player board here for you to insert that wheel. And then you're just going to place these rings uh, on each level. Now, these rings have notches uh, or little, little symbols right here, okay? And you're going to use those to line up the board with this edge here, okay? So if you can see, we have the two notches here. They're going to start lined up with this edge. These two notches here, same thing. They're going to line up with this edge. And then this has a little symbol here so that all three rings, their little symbols, are lined up with the edge of the board. You're then, for your starting game, the suggested setup for your uh, wheel here is to place one city token in this location, a journey token at this location, and the tool in this location. The remaining three goods, the pink, green, and black goods, they will go here, here, and here. However, you may place them in any order that you want. And it is recommended that each player sets them up just a little bit differently, that no uh, two players will have the exact same layout. So as far as these tokens, they can go wherever you want, but they need to go in those three spaces. And you are now ready to play Noria. All right, Nori has played over a set number of rounds, depending on the number of players. In a two-player game, it is played over 16 rounds. Now, we're going to concentrate first on the top half of this board because it needs some explanation and because it is the main way that you're going to be getting victory points. In fact, it's the only way that you'll be getting victory points is through this track and the values that are represented by these numbers here. Now these four scoring tracks are considered paths in the game. They're, they are the refinement and settlement paths, the uh, exploration, and research paths. Uh, for the rest of the game I won't call them by that, but these are tracks or paths that you're going to be trying to move up to score you more points. Now, each of these paths have different steps, and the steps are numbered 1 through 9. To move up a path, you're going to need to turn in a required number of goods, represented by this number, and looking at the type of good that you'll need to turn in. Now, on this scoring track, you have easier goods to acquire and harder goods to acquire, and the scoring track represents that because these tracks are going to be worth more. So for example, if I wanted to move up this track, uh, I need to pay two of the black goods to go here, another two here, four here. Here I need two of either the pink or the green goods, but if you have a path that has the not equal sign, such as here, 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 and here, oh, not there, but there. Anyway, you need to turn in three goods but they can't all be the same. So you would need at least two green and one per, uh, pink, or two pink, one green, etc. Now at the beginning of the game, all of these paths are worth zero victory points. No way. The way that these paths become valuable is that during the game, you're going to influence these politicians to move into the various seats or chambers. As they move in, others are going to get removed from the game to make those paths less less <laughs> <laughs> nice to make those paths less valuable okay we're going to look at how you score victory points at the end of the game so one thing you need to know is that your player or your workers or whatever you want to call them you can have one on each path they can be on the same spot all right but 
you can't have more than one on each path. At the end of the game, you're going to take a look at uh, each path. And in this case, red has someone that is on six. So you look at this number here for this pot, spot number six. You look at the far leftmost visible number, which is a four, and you multiply it. Four times six, so this path is worth 24 points. This path here is three, so it's three times the six for 18 points. Now, the red player did not have anyone on this path, so they score nothing here. And then up here, they were on six times eight, so that was 48 points for that path. Additionally, you have these two scoring tracks. So this one says that you take your highest worker and whatever path number they are on, you'll multiply it times this number. Now the red player has two that are on six, but you only score one of them. So this would be six times two for an additional 12 points. This one here states that whoever, wherever you have your lowest worker, you will take that, and the red player has one on number three. So you would think it'd be three times eight, it'd be 24 points. But because the red player still has one player worker left in the cave, they will score zero points. This is considered zero is their lowest, so they get nothing here. However, the yellow player who has one on three as their lowest will get to score the additional 24 points because they have all four of their workers out there. So that is how scoring works in Noria. Okay, let's take a look more closely at your wheel here. Now, when you're considering your wheel, these are the action discs. These are the actions that you'll be able to take during your turn. What's important to note is that you will be using this half of the wheel to activate your discs. This half is considered out of play. And during the game, we'll be rotating this clockwise so that these actions will be more into the active portion. Again, as we talked about earlier, these, this edge of the board is what is considered your active area. Okay, so let's say the game has progressed a little bit and you know it's your turn and this is what your half of the wheel looks like now. Uh, yeah, these are empty. Normally they wouldn't be, at least hopefully not, or you are playing the game wrong. However, uh, this is for illustrative purposes. So when it comes to activating your disc, now on your turn, you get to activate uh, three discs, one on each wheel. Now the discs that you activate have to be adjacent. So you can activate this one, this one, and this one, or this one, and those or this one, this one, and this one, or these three here. Those are the ones that are considered adjacent. Okay, so let's jump into how a round works. The first thing the start player will do is remove one of the round markers. Now, uh, because uh, I'm missing a disc, you know, we can't really do that, but these round markers have a times 10 on the back of them. This is because these round markers have a dual purpose. The goods in the game are not limited, so if at any time you need to replenish the pool and you have more than 10, you can take one of these markers. However, since I'm missing a start marker, we'll just start with that one. Okay, each round of Noria is broken into four phases, and a player will do all four phases before the next player goes. The first phase is called the influence phase. And you're allowed to spend one knowledge to be able to manipulate this wheel. By spending a knowledge, you can rotate one of your two bottom rings one space clockwise. Remember, we were talking about these little markings on here, so if I wanted to rotate the middle wheel, I would rotate it from this marking to this one like so, or basically 25%. You cannot spend knowledge to rotate the top wheel. I could also do that on the bottom. The markings are a little bit more close, so it wouldn't go as far. I could rotate it something like that. Now, I am able to rotate the wheels more than once, but whenever you do that, you have to pay double. So the first time you rotate a wheel, it costs one, the second time two, the third time four, and so on. 
The other thing you can do is spend two of the knowledge tokens. We only have one, but if you had two, you can swap the location of any two discs. You cannot swap a disc into an empty spot, but you can even swap the top one for one anywhere else. Next, you'll move into the action phase, and this is where the meat of your gameplay is going to take place. In our turn example, we are going to use one influence to rotate one of the wheels uh, clockwise. So I think I'll rotate this wheel like so. The reason I want to do this is because, remember, during the action phase, you are going to get to activate up to three adjacent discs. Well, with the way it was to start, I didn't have three. In fact, I only had one. I had one here, so I could activate those three spots, these three, those three, or those three. So by rotating at one spot, I will get to activate two of my three wheels. So now's a good time to talk about what the various actions are that you can take. Now, your player board does show you how each of the discs work. And some of the discs have two purposes or two actions in which you get to decide which action you want to take when you activate that disc. So the easiest ones to discuss are the black, the green, and the pink basic goods. Whenever you activate one of these three discs, you're going to just take that good from the pool like a, we did earlier in the setup and just put it in front of you. You get one good for every airship you have. So if I activate these two rings, we would get one black and one green good because we have one black and one green airship. The more of these airships you have, the more the goods you'll collect when you do these actions. Now the next action that you could activate is a city action and it has two different actions that you can choose from. The first action is to move up on one of these four paths. All right. To do that, you have to turn in the goods required to move up onto that path. And you can either move up on one that you've started from or move from the cave into and go into one of the other paths. Again, you have to have the goods to be able to do that. But we do have uh, two green goods here. So we could move up to here because this requires either two pink or two green. And I would just return these to the supply and I can move up on that track. Now, keep in mind, if you are going to move up on a track that, say, someone else is already ahead of you on, so if I wanted to move from here up to here, because the yellow player is ahead of me, I have to pay any good of my choice in addition to the goods required to move here. So here I would need to do spend a clock, a fan, or a sail, and then one good of my choice to move up there. And you have to pay that good for every player that is ahead of you on that path. The other city action that you can take is to go to this market here. Now you have your three basic goods and when you choose to do a city action, you can take one of these discs for free. And when you do take that, you'll just put it on top of your disc and you'll place that during the fourth phase. You can also buy these particular goods. Now, in your first game, the recommended setup is to have the city, the journey, the tool, and the bonus disc cost one, two, three, or four goods. And those are four goods of your choice that you could turn in and then buy one of these. And then you get to place it here, again, putting it into your wheel during phase four. Now the next action you can choose to do is the journey action. Don't stop believing, baby. Don't. Stop believing. Alrighty. Anyway, when you take the journey action, you your ambassador can go to uh, an island or discover an island. These here are your island tiles, and there are a bunch of them to start the game. Depending on the number of players, you're going to put those out. So we have five for a two-player game. The first person to take the journey action will go ahead and take the one off the top and just place it on the side of the board. Now, this particular uh, island tells you that, first, you can build a sail or a fan factory or factories on this island. Another thing, it's going to tell you how many airships 
will go on here. So whenever you place uh, one of these islands out, you're going to seed it with some airships. The number of airships that you'll be putting out depends on the number of players. So you will always add uh, airships equal to the number of players and then plus or minus depending on the symbol here. If it is a blue up arrow, you add one. However, in this case, we have uh, black and pink airships, all right? And this says that uh, you would have play number of players minus two, number of players minus one. Now in a two player game, you're always going to have at least one airship on here. So we would put one pink and then one black on this particular one. And also note, this one has uh, lamps and sails that you can manufacture. All right, so when you go to an island there, you'll put that out. Like I said, you will seed it with a number of ships, and then your ambassador will go to that island. From here, you can do one of two things. You can either just take one of the airships and add it to your fleet there uh, by giving you, every time you collect one of these, uh, you'll get two goods instead of one of them. And I guess it's important to note that when you're activating your discs, you can do them in any order. So let's let's just say this was here. I could have done the journey action first so that I could go and get another airship so that I could then collect more goods when I did these actions. Now the other thing you can do is to build a factory and everyone has seven factories to start. All right, if you wanna build a factory, you're just gonna take the top most left one or top left most one or top left most one, uh. whatever. You're gonna take that and then you're going to decide uh, what you wanna cover up. Now, as we mentioned earlier, these tiles allow you to build certain factories. So this one's going to build you a lamp factory or a sail factory, all right? And again, for this path, you need either pistons or lamps to move up. And on this track, you need uh, either uh, clocks, fans, or sails. All right, so each tile here is gonna have one or two squares, and that is how many warehouses you will get to build if you decide to take that action when you journey. So instead of taking this airship, we could have taken one of our factories and just covered up the sail. And we'd cover up the one with two squares on them. When you do this, you're going to take the number of squares of that type that you covered up. So in this case, we would be taking uh, two of these sails, all right? Now, these sails here are double-sided. This side shows you what is required to build them, and then when you do make them or manufacture them, you'll flip them over so that you can then spend during your city action to move up on these paths. When you acquire them, you're going to place them onto your board, like so, on the empty side. Now, the next player that decides to do a journey action, let's say the yellow player decides, they can either go to one that's already discovered or they can pull one from the tile, from the uh, stack here until they've run out. Now, you can always go to one that's already occupied, but if you do, then you're going to have to pay a good of your choice for every other player that is on that spot. Let's say my turn came around again and I was going to do the city action. I must move to a different island. I cannot stay on that one. All right, the next action you have is the tool, the little hammer icon. When you activate this, you are allowed to upgrade any of the discs on your wheel. So, for example, uh, these all of these are double-sided. So. Uh, I could turn this over. It has a yellow side. And now when I activate this in the future, I get to do that action twice because it is now upgraded. There are rules about how many actions you can take and how to use multiple upgraded uh, uh, discs. And I'll go into detail with, on that in a little bit. Okay, so please note, a, a tool cannot upgrade itself. You would need another tool activated and then you could act to upgrade uh, the other tool. The other action you can do with the tool is to manufacture goods and we'll cover that in a little bit more detail uh, in a little bit. I forgot to mention when you're doing the journey action and you build factories, 
the first one that you uncover is going to uncover one of these symbols. That means at the end of the round, you're now going to be collecting one knowledge at the end of every turn. The next time you build a factory, you have to take this one. There's a little arrow here that lets you know you do this one, then this one, and you kind of snake through there. Every time you uncover one of the leftmost ones or build that, it gives you an extra knowledge. So at the end of every turn, you'll be collecting more of these knowledge tokens. All right, the last item that you have is the bonus disc and nobody you don't start with one of these to start the game but if you have a bonus disc that you're activating that allows you to add one extra action to one of your other discs okay so uh, let's say I was activating these three I would take this bonus disc and I would say this particular disc I want to give an extra action to so I could now do this action three times and I would collect three times the number of airships that I have in green goods. Now, if it is an upgraded bonus disc, you are now able to give one other activated action two additional actions, or to the other two activation discs and give them one extra turn. Now is a good time to go over upgraded discs along with this bonus disc. Okay, uh, let's say I've been using my tool to upgrade some various discs. I've upgraded my bonus disc, I've upgraded the green goods and the journey action. The first thing you need to know when you are activating an upgraded disc, let's say I wanted to activate these three, all right? You have to decide which of the three are, is going to act as an upgraded disc. You only get to activate one upgraded disc per turn. So let's say I wanted to do the journey action uh, twice or even let's say three times. I'll show you how that works in just a second. If I decide to do that, I'm gonna say, okay, this is the one I want to, to count as my upgraded disc. You are in effect, if it helps you to remember, you don't have to do this, you'll turn on, you could turn over the others to kind of remind you, they don't get to act as an upgraded disc now. Another thing to remember is that you can never take more than four actions on your turn. So keeping those two rules in mind will help you. So the way this would work is first of all, I have a bonus disc. So the rules state that when you have a bonus disc, you have to assign it to one of the other discs that you're going to activate. You have to do that first. So since I decided not to use this as an upgraded disc. I am going to give this one extra action. All right, so when I collect green goods, I get to do it twice, two times the number of airships that I would have. So that's two actions. Then I get to do the journey action twice. That would be a total of four actions. But let's say, let's say, I wanted to do, say we had this. Let's say I wanted to activate this as my upgraded disc for the round. And I'm still going to activate these three. Again, because I am activating this as my bonus or my upgrade, you can just like pretend that these are non-upgraded tokens. And I am going to decide to give each because on an upgraded disc, I can choose two other discs to get an additional action. I'm going to give this one an extra action and this one an extra action. So in effect, I will get to do this one twice and this one twice for a total of four actions. Okay, let's talk about the other tool action that you can take that we didn't talk about earlier. We're gonna say the game has progressed a little bit here. Uh, we've been building up our airships. We've been going out and, and getting our supplies. Very nice. Uh, we've gone through and uh, both players have been discovering islands, building factories. As you can see, we have built factories for each of the five types. So now we have warehouses of each type. For your tool action, you can either manufacture all the goods in one row. So for example, these fans cost one black and one pink each. I could do that whole row 
uh, spending three black and three pink, and then I would just simply turn them over to show that they are ready for use. Or you can complete or manufacture one good in each row. And I think I'm going to do that instead. So this one takes two green. This one here is two pink and a black. This is a green and a black here, a black and a pink, and one of each. All right, I would return those to the pool, and now these goods are now available so that when I take a city action in the future, I can now spend, let's say I wanted to move up on this track, I can now spend my one piston that requires a piston to move up to this track. So when you spend it, you just turn it over and then you can remanufacture it. So those are the various actions that you can take on your wheel. Okay, so that is the action phase. Once you have activated the three discs that you want, you're now going to move on to the politics phase. Now in the politics phase, uh, you are allowed to spend knowledge that you've acquired to seat one of the politicians. As the game progresses, it's going to cost more. The cost to uh, influence one politician is based on the number of uncovered knowledge tokens. And so this one also counts. So if these were uh, uncovered, it would cost four knowledge to uh, seat a politician. When you do that, you're going to move one of the gray cubes down into one of the seats. You're going to move it into the uh, far left seat. And then you will remove one from, say, another track. Maybe we would remove this one. And it is removed from the game. Now, once a politician is seated, uh, they cannot be removed. Now, uh, as I mentioned earlier, these paths or these tracks are all, these, these paths are worth zero at the beginning. You have to be able to seat politicians to start making these tracks worth something. Again, these are the multipliers for those various paths. The politics phase is optional. You don't have to spend knowledge to do that, but you may if you want to. I do have one more thing about uh, politicians, the political phase. You are allowed to do that as many times as you can afford. It follows the same principle that we've talked about earlier. If you, let's say it was earlier in the round and it only cost one, or earlier in the game and it only cost one to influence a politician, you'd spend one knowledge to seat one and remove another. Then you would have to spend two more, then four more, then eight more uh, to be able to continue to influence as many politicians that you wanted. After you're done with that, you will then move on to the administration phase. In the administration phase, you're going to take any discs that you bought using city actions earlier, and you can place them onto your wheel. You can place them anywhere you want. You can even replace other discs. So if I didn't want this pink one anymore, I could replace it, okay? The next thing you're gonna do is rotate all of your wheels. So this wheel will move from that notch to this one, again, lined up with the board. This one turns 25% to line up with the next notch. And this one just turns a whole 50%. And now your uh, wheels are ready for the next round. Also, you will collect knowledge based on how many of these uh, factories you have uncovered. Play will then move to the next player. Once it gets back to the start player, you'll remove another round marker. And when you get all the way up to the last round marker and remove it, everyone will have one more round. And then you'll do final scoring. A couple of notes on some of the places on the board. So for example, here, this means that when you uncover this round marker, to be able to rotate a wheel will now cost you an additional knowledge or two knowledge to rotate a wheel once. If you wanna do it twice in the same round, it'll now cost you two plus another four. If you wanna swap two of your discs, that is now going to cost you three knowledge. Up here, you also have uh, the black market. You can spend goods. Let's say I had a clock that I wasn't going to use. I could turn that in to get two knowledge. You could turn in a piston or a lamp to get three knowledge, or you could turn in three knowledge to get one good of your choice. 
All right, let's say it is the end of the game. How do we figure up our final scores? Well, the first thing you're gonna do is look at each of these tracks, and you're gonna look at the leftmost number that is showing, and that is going to be the multiple for that path. So in this case, if we're taking a look at the red player, the red player over here is on the uh, fifth step of that path. The path is worth two times multiplier, so two times five is 10. That path is worth 10 points. Over here is on the third step, and it is worth six points, so red player would get 18 points. Red player did not get on this path, so the red player gets zero points. And then on this path, again, on the fifth step, and it is 12 points, so five times 12, 60 points for that path. When you're done scoring those paths, you're gonna look at these two paths. Now, this one says that you're going to score a multiplier for your highest worker. So the red player has two that are on the fifth step, but you only get to uh, score one of them. And it, it doesn't matter which one, it would just be five times two for an additional 10 points. This one says that you get to have a multiplier based on your lowest worker. Now, because the red player had one worker left in the cave, that counts as zero points, so you do not get to participate in this scoring. However, the yellow player has all four of her workers out, so she would score two, because this is the lowest, which is on the second step, times eight for an additional 16 points. You add up all the points from your four paths, plus those two extra tracks, whoever has the most victory points is the winner of the game. Noria. All right, so that is Noria. Let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the components. Overall, I think the components are pretty good. I think there's some room for improvements. For example, the round markers. Very small, very fiddly. I like the concept of, you know, the path for the round markers. I like the you know, dual nature use for those markers. But I think I wish they would have gone with something either maybe a little larger or maybe a different route is, like I said, they're kind of fiddly. And as you can see uh, in the video, I already lost one of them. Uh, also, the path numbers at the top of the board, they're hard to read. They're kind of faint, faintly printed on the board. So there are nine different steps and a lot of times, especially with the new players, they don't, they can't see those numbers or they're, they're overlooking them, uh, not realizing that's the number you're multiplying, not the resource number that is next to them. The wheel and player board combination. I wish there was something a, a, maybe delineated a little better on that board as far as how you're supposed to line up your wheel. Maybe made, make the markings on that wheel pop a little more, or maybe some arrows on the side of the player board that you know tells you, line these up right here. Because that seems to be the most confusing thing that I've seen so far with newer players is they're not quite sure where they're supposed to stop when they're spinning the wheel. And it's usually the larger, largest wheel that uh, players have the, have the most trouble with. Also the sideboard, while I like it, uh, the concept of it, as far as placing warehouse tiles on them, there's no need to even notch them because you're turning them over, you know, you're, you're, you're by or you're creating them when you go to the islands and then you're manufacturing the goods. So you're flipping them and then flipping them back and flipping them again. And if you bump your board, it gets everything kind of uh, uh, jiggled around there. So... I don't even bother notching the warehouse tiles. Now the airships, they fit in there really, really well. Uh, usually not a problem there. So just a minor thing uh, components wise. Overall though, the components, like I said, I think they're, they're pretty good. You have um, really nice artwork on the, on the board. Uh, even the back side of the board has the island uh, redrawn, kind of a nice touch instead of just a blank board on the back. Uh, and the artwork throughout is, is pretty nice. The wheel mechanism locks into the player board very nicely. The wheel seems to work 
very well. Some people have said it's a little fiddly for them. I really haven't had that problem, and the games that I've seen, that really hasn't been an issue. I think that the wheel works well. It's well made and um, a nice component. Also, you have uh, nice thick uh, cardboard components, like, for example, the island tiles. They could have just went with cards, but instead they used uh, nice thick tiles for those. And really, even the components for like your airships and resource and everything, very bright, vibrant covers, colors that uh, are very easy to see. So again, while the components could have had maybe, in my very humble opinion, uh, maybe a, uh, a few improvements, overall I think the components were pretty good. Now, as far as the gameplay goes, I'd have to say after my first play of that, I wasn't sold. Uh, it seemed like the game could be a little mean. See, when we played our first game, we just set up the wheel however we wanted. There is, uh, in the instructions, a way that you can set up the, the wheel for your first game or, or, or maybe even a preferred way to set it up. Uh, until you become more familiar with the game and then it says that you can maybe just go ahead and set it up the way you want. Well, that's kind of what we did. By doing that, we ended up setting up so we had three moves right away. If you set it up with the way they per have mentioned uh, for your starter game, chances are you're going to use your knowledge token to rotate your wheel so that you can use one action which means you won't have a knowledge token at the end of the round to be able to seat a politician. In our first game, since we didn't need to rotate our wheel, all of us were seating politicians in that first round. And all of us started on a different path. So it seemed kind of mean because you were, of course, seating a politician in on your path and then instinctively removing uh, politicians from your opponent's paths, and it kind of seemed mean. Additionally, uh, the scoring at the end felt a little lacking. It's, you know, you have these nine steps to go up, and we really didn't make it far on any of them. It seems like there was a little bit of a, you can go on all tracks, but you're not going to go very high, or maybe you go on most of the tracks and try to climb a little higher. It just, it just felt like it was kind of lacking. But that was on the first play. After subsequent plays of the game, I feel a lot better. Setting up that wheel as outlined for your first play mitigated a lot of the meanness that we kind of felt in our first game because we were using the knowledge to manipulate the wheel. And really, in the end, you want to be on all the paths. So whenever you are removing a politician, you're really hurting yourself in the end as well. Sure, you might be targeting your opponents because they're already on that path, but it really is just kind of setting up different ways that scoring will work for every game. And in that way, it kind of lends itself to uh, some replayability. On top of that, the more that I played, the more I realized those knowledge tokens, while it's good to seat politicians, they can be much more valuable in manipulating that wheel or maybe even buying uh, you know, a, a necessary resource by trading in three of them. So that first game, while, while it felt kind of harsh and lacking, really I really came to appreciate the nuances in the scoring and of the different tokens and seating politicians uh, that the game affords each play thereafter. To me, I think the game has a very interesting set of mechanics in it because while the, the main thing that you seem to be building is your wheel, you know, you're trying to build that engine, you really have two other engines as well. You are trying to make sure that you get enough airships and, and building that engine, and then you have the warehouses making sure that you're collecting enough of those tiles which in turn also, because you're building factories on the islands, you are sending, you're, you're gaining more knowledge each turn. So you're building those two engines and then you're trying to build your 
wheel engine all at the same time and, and trying to get all three of these things to work together um, in, in a nice symbiotic uh, relationship. That's terrible. But... Yes, indeed. The three of those things working together is very interesting. You see, scoring is tight and unforgiving. In one of the plays that we had, a friend of mine said that he liked the game because he likes games where it forces you to make efficient turns. And when he said that, that's when it, it clicked. That's the word I had been looking for. You really need to make your turns efficient if you want to be successful in Noria. You see, setting up your wheel is easy, but making it efficient and timely is difficult to be able to make the moves that you need at the right time take some very careful planning, deep planning, if, if I may say so. You see, you need those airships to be able to make your resource actions more meaningful. And you need the factories so that you can gain important knowledge tokens and to build your warehouses. So we'll, when you're taking those island actions or the journey actions, you're constantly wondering, okay, what do I need to get? Man, I really want to place a factory, but I really need some airships. And then looking at the wheel and what's going to be coming up, uh, again, very tight uh, mechanics that work well together. While you're trying to create all this, while you're trying to build this engine, you're also trying to make sure that you're not falling behind on anyone else's paths because it becomes more expensive to move up. Especially, you know, if you're playing two-player game, it's really not too bad. But when you get, you know, two or three people ahead of you on a path and you're having to spend resources just to move up and then all of those additional resources, there are a lot of things to consider. You don't want to wait too long, but you're also trying to build your engine. Again, just a very delicate balance uh, in Noria. So making those three engines uh, work together is challenging, but it's fun. But then this is also kind of where the game leaves me wanting a little more. It takes so many rounds to finally get the three engines built and humming along and working the way that you want, and then it seems like the game ends. There seems to be a trade-off as well, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, it seems like you can try to make sure you get on all four paths so that you can do, you know, maybe that additional scoring paths that, that are on the uh, side of the game board. Um, but you're not going to make it up very far. Or you can try to shoot up really high on maybe a couple of tracks and score... Uh, a lot of points that way sacrificing maybe some additional points that you can get for being on all four tracks so for me i, I kind of wish maybe there was a a couple more rounds to it i guess that's a good thing when you play a game and you're like you no, i don't want it to end not yet uh and you just want that one more round to get the things done that you want um but either maybe a couple more rounds or maybe allowed to take one or two more actions instead of the four action limit. Uh, maybe the black market could be a little bit more helpful. I mean, spending three knowledge for one resource seems very overpriced. And yet, you find yourself paying it because you need that one more resource to do, um, uh, to, to move up on a, a path or something that you're willing to spend it, but maybe if it was a little bit better pricing, then maybe the scoring would feel a little more fulfilling in it. But overall, I really do enjoy the game. I just wish there was maybe a little bit of tweaking here and there. I love building the wheel, I love building the wheel the way that I want and being able to see what actions are going to be coming up. I find it very interesting to figure out what paths I'm going to be moving up that I really want to focus on based on how the scoring is going with the politicians being seated. 
I believe that really adds to the replayability and really adds to the enjoyment of the game. So for me, I give Noria an 8. Now, if you've enjoyed this review, uh, please hit the like button below or leave a nice comment. And once again, I thank you for stopping by. Thank you for visiting the Arch Gaming Network. For more great content, check us out at archgamingnetwork.com. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook.